Racecraft by Barbara J. Fields and Karen Fields. This is chapter one. Chapter one is pretty long, so I'm going to do it in two parts. So this is chapter one, part one. A tour of racecraft. The ideas of racecraft are pieced together in the ordinary course of everyday doing. Along the way, they intertwine with ideas that shape other aspects of American social life. Those of racecraft govern what goes with what and whom. Sumptuary codes, how different people must deal with each other, rituals of deference and dominance, where human kinship begins and ends, blood, and how Americans look at themselves and each other, the gaze. These ideas do not exist purely in the mind or in only one mind. They are social facts, like six o'clock, both an idea and a reality. Because racecraft exists in this way, its constant remaking constantly retreats from view. This, now you see it, now you don't, quality is what makes racism, the practice of a double standard based on ancestry, possible. To eliminate racecraft from the fabric of our lives, we must first unravel the threads from which it is woven. Thus, the current guided tour. Its three sections, from racism to race, blood works, and how Americans look, are not linear. The sections circuit and overlap, like the social facts of everyday life that they chronicle. From racism to race. Begin with a story about travel in Mississippi circa 1964, a time and place when racecraft daily performed its conjurer's trick of transforming racism into race, leaving black persons in view while removing white persons from the stage. To spectators deceived by the trick, segregation seemed to be a property of black people, not something white people imposed on them. But Robert S. McNamara, in his memoir of service during the administration of Lyndon B. Johnson, recounts an incident that set all parties on the stage. While addressing business and labor leaders whom he had summoned to the White House to demand their help in passing the Civil Rights Bill, Johnson told a story of the day he and Lady Bird lived Jim Crow. Johnson was speeding along a road in Mississippi with his wife and their black longtime cook, Zephyr, when Lady Bird turned to him and said, Would you please stop at the next gas station, restroom? They stopped. Not long thereafter, Zephyr said, Mr. President, would you mind stopping by the side of the road? The president replied with his well-known earthiness. Why the hell didn't you do it when Bird and I did? Zephyr answered, because they wouldn't let me. Notice Zephyr's they. At that point in the story, LBJ pounded on the table and in a bitter voice said, Gentlemen, is that the kind of country you want? It's not the kind I want. For a brief moment, Johnson had lived Jim Crow as Zephyr did. Ordinarily, white Southerners experienced Jim Crow as law and order, not as the ever-present disorder it was for black Southerners. So white Southerners did not notice or need to notice their own presence on the Jim Crow stage. McNamara's anecdote recaptures a moment when Jim Crow inconvenienced the President of the United States. The disorder engendered by racecraft did not end with Jim Crow. What better typifies it than being killed by mistake, as happened not long ago to an Afro-American police officer? While pursuing a car thief, the officer was shot to death by a white brother officer who took him for a criminal. The instant, inevitable, but upon examination bizarre, diagnosis of many people is that black officers in such situations have been killed because of their skin color. But has their skin color killed them? If so, why does the skin color of white officers not kill them in the same way? Why do black officers not mistake white officers for criminals and blaze away, even when the white officers are dressed to look like street toughs? Everyone has skin color, but not everyone's skin color counts as race, let alone as evidence of criminal conduct. The missing step between someone's physical appearance and an, in and an invidious outcome is the practice of a double standard. In a word, racism. It was his fellow officer, not his skin color, that caused the black officer's death. 
Even so, the fellow officer was devastated by his error and its fatal consequence. His grief and that of other white officers visibly weighed down the sad procession in blue that conducted the dead policeman toward his final rest. Racism did not require a racist. It required only that, in the split second before firing the fatal, fatal shot, the white officer entered the twilight zone of America's racecraft. Minority ranks alongside the color of their skin as a verbal prop for the mental trick that turns racism into race. The word slips its literal meaning as well as its core definition, which is quantitative. Vice President Spiro Agnew once demonstrated his once demonstrated the trick unconsciously, responding to a question about American policy toward the white supremacist regime in what was then Rhodesia, he said it was no business of the United States how other countries dealt with their minorities, by which he meant the country's black majority. The quantitative meaning slips again in the paradoxical formula majority-minority, referring to the projected numerical predominance of non-white persons in the United States in the not-so-distant future. If the logic were harmless, it would be hilarious. But minority is not harmless. Zigzagging between quantitative and invidious meanings, it justified a dragnet in September 1992 in which officers rounded up all the black and Hispanic men and some women in Oneonta, New York. <clears throat> Police deployed the dragnet after an elderly white woman, victim of an attempted armed robbery, described her assailant as a black male possibly young and with an injured wrist. Is it imaginable that police would round up, detain, question, and search every white person in a town because an elderly victim of attempted armed robbery described her assailant as a white male, possibly young and possibly with an injured wrist? Would they, furthermore, obtain lists of all white students on the local campus of the State University of New York, question them, and check their arms for signs of injury? detain white men found arriving in or leaving the town by bus, pull over cars carrying white persons, and even stop a white female admissions officer en route to visit her ailing grandmother. When a group of students posed that, hypothet that hypothetical question to a police official, he answered that it would not have been practical. Practical hid the qualitative and invidious meaning of minority inside the quantitative one. It would not have been practical to arrest and search every white man in town over a vague suspicion attaching to, to one. Neither would it have passed muster as legitimate police work. Next on the tour, consider a habit so fundamental that, without it, there can be no racecraft, the will to classification. Writing in the New York Times, a social work consultant describes his intervention to stop a young woman from slapping her young child on the subway. Ordering her to stop, he threatens to call the police. Of about 30 persons in the car, only a woman in her 50s seated near the young woman takes a hand, quietly suggesting ways to handle the child without slapping. A stranger from Mars, if suitably briefed about New York subways, might have considered intervention by two out of about 30 people, a high percentage, whoever the interveners were. Observing through the smoke of racecraft, however, the New Yorker immediately shuffles the protagonists into categories. He, a 54-year-old white Jewish guy, the child slapper, a young, or sorry, 54, sorry, a 54-year-old white Jewish guy, the child slapper, a young African-American kid with a kid, the quiet counselor, an African-American woman in her 50s, and two white men who congratulated him for intervening after the fact and at a safe distance. His first impression, that the silent onlookers from whom he wished he had received more support were mainly black, gave way upon later reflection to the realization that, actually, there were many more whites. Recounting the story to a friend, the consultant again classifies his friend, a 30-something Arab Canadian, says, I don't get the white and black in this. Why would you want the black people to jump in and give you support? Are the black people her people and the white people yours? The consultant regards 
His friend's response is a post-racial analysis. Not so fast. The Arab Canadian is the nearest equivalent to a stranger from Mars, a person raised outside the force field of American racism, whose view therefore is not distorted by the haze of expectations. In other words, racecraft, through which the American bred consultant filters what he sees. The Canadian is the outsider who attributes a drought, a crop failure, or an illness to ordinary cause and effect. The American is the insider on the alert for witchcraft. That imprint of American rearing is not limited to white Americans, nor does travel abroad automatically disable its mental apparatus. Thus, a black American woman professor recently arrived in France, staggers into a 16th century church to escape the hot sun of Bordeaux in August. Looking straight ahead from the entrance, her vision zooms towards an image at the very center of the stained glass window behind the altar, a black slave kneeling and in chains. She asks Bordeaux residents the why and wherefore of it. They are astonished to learn that such an image exists in that well-known old church. Some openly doubt the report. Where? And what makes you think it is a slave? One Saturday afternoon, the parish priest arrives to prepare for a wedding, just as the American visitor from Mars is leading a tour for University of Bordeaux students. The priest is as amazed as the students. By rights, the window had other claimants to attention. A crusader in his red cross tunic stood prominently on the slave's right. Above him, a huge Mary rose toward heaven, yet the eyes of the American went straight to the man in chains. Black, black people everywhere do not see alike. Persons from Africa and the Caribbean may not see what Afro-Americans see. Visualize the Afro-American professor again, this time in Washington, D.C., en route to Union Station on a rainy fall afternoon in 2008, flagging down a taxi. She is safely on board when the African driver spots a soaked white traveler loaded with baggage. He glances at her through the rearview mirror to ask if it will be all right to pick up the other traveler as well. Why, of course. He pulls to the curb and proposes. The traveler jumps his face the very portrait of fear. No, thank you. No, no, thank you. Getting underway again, the driver again glances in the mirror. What was wrong with him? At the professor's explanation, he saw a car full of black people. The driver exclaims, his face registering shock, shocked understanding. Asked later where he is from, he says, I am Egyptian. In not instantly seeing the reality that both the white and the black American did, the African cab driver qualifies as a Martian too. So do children before they have absorbed the classification system. In late June of 2009, 65 children aged 6 to 12, most of them Afro-American or Hispanic, bounced out of their bus and ran toward the pool of the Valley Club in Huntington Valley, Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia. Their day camp, Creative Steps, had a contract with the club for swimming one afternoon each week. At first sight of the children, the club members at the pool rose and flew like startled birds. Made for the exits and pulled for their children out of the pool were phrases that appeared in reports of the ensuing uproar. What exactly did pulling their children out look like? How must a child have felt to be pulled out or to see others pulled out? What about the three white children whose parents let them stay? Most of all, how is it that grown-ups decided all at once to run from children? On the following day, the club banned all the summer camps that had contracted to use the pool, which prompted the Justice Department to file suit. Members began explaining their actions to themselves and to the press. According to the club's president, there was concern that a lot of kids would change the complexion and the atmosphere of the club. Encouraged to rephrase, one supposes, he later affirmed that the event had nothing to do with race. There simply were too many children in the pool, so the situation went from a safe swim club to an unsafe swim club. The director of Creative Steps pointed out that the contract specified 65 children and that no one was misbehaving. The campers overheard remarks, prompting a seven-year-old to ask if she was too dark to go swimming. Her white counterparts almost certainly made guesses of their own, but none were reported, as though only the black children had experienced and would remember those moments. 
To the contrary, interviews hint at discussions that almost certainly occurred within and among the families. One man, who seems to speak for others, tells CNN that, as general members, we were not told that they were coming. If we knew, we could decide not to come when the pool was crowded or come anyway. We could have had an option. By contrast, the need for such an option does not seem to have crossed the mind of the club president or his wife, both white. He speaks with the personal burden of having negotiated the ill-starred contract. She recounts a birthday party for the camp director's son and his friends, held at the pool without incident the week before. In an on-camera interview, the couple faced the arrows alone. No other club members stand nearby. They identify themselves as Obama voters to the sneers of some bloggers. The husband confesses to a poor choice of words and disavows the sentiment. But in the hubbub, his action, having negotiated the contract, cannot speak louder than those words. The wife, in a how could this happen torrent, blurts out that a little boy, just eight years old, had cried on CNN, cried on CNN. He didn't deserve to feel those feelings. The viewer sees raw emotion on a mother's face. The interviewer seems not to and does not probe. Two hot seats have sprung up, one inside with club members, the other outside with sound biting news hounds. By turning shocked and confused, furious and disillusioned, the couple seem to be good people, brutally waylaid in a white neighborhood they thought they knew well and once believed safe. Whereas the children had not understood the classification system, the director and his wife had not grasped until the moment came that a sumptuary code was in effect. Sumptuary codes enforce social classification. They consist of rules, written or, unre written or unwritten, that establish unequal rank and make it immediately visible. When there is no phenotypic difference, like the little girl's too dark skin, sumptuary rules do what nature leaves undone. In the pre-revolutionary France to which Tocqueville referred, sumptuary rules overcame visually sim visual similarity by defining who might or must, where or use what, where they must or must not go, and so on through limitless elaboration. Louis the ninth, fourteenth, can never remember if an X is a five or ten. I don't know. One of the Louis weakened the nobility by compelling them to live opulently at Versailles. Even physical appearance, however, cannot speak inequality by itself. Sumptuary rules in slaveholding America reserved certain fabrics for slaves and might forbid certain colors. In that spirit, a group of Charlestonians demanded legislation to prevent the slaves from wearing silks, satins, crepes, lace, mu lace muslins, and such costly stuffs as are looked upon and considered the luxury of dress, because every distinction should be created between the whites and the Negroes calculated to make the latter feel the superiority of the former. An emancipated slave acted in the same spirit when she defined freedom as buying herself a blue dress with polka dots. In post-slavery America, Jim Crow presided over its own sumptuary code. A century ago, that code governed who might be received at the White House. In his remarkable concession speech on election night 2008, John McCain mentioned the national storm that buffeted the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt after he invited Booker T. Washington to dine at the White House, acknowledging and praising the enormous change since. The story is more intricate than McCain had time for, or perhaps even knew. Washington was the president of Tuskegee Institute and probably the best known Afro-American at the time. Moreover, he was a political ally of Roosevelt's and the chief referee of federal patronage in the South during the administrations of Roosevelt and his successor, William H. Taft, the sort of person, in other words, that a president in invites to dine at the White House. But not in 1907, at least not for publication in the South. The worst enemy to his race of any white man who has ever occupied so high a place in this republic was the verdict of the New Orleans Daily Picayune on Roosevelt's defense. Roosevelt complained that he had appointed fewer 
Negroes and more white Democrats and showed more solicitude for Southern feelings than any previous Republican president, yet he had been rewarded with more hatred than any of them. Once Roosevelt had regained his popularity among white Southerners, public memory converted the dinner into a lunch, which, for reasons impenetrable today, did not carry the same taboo. Rules designed to promote feelings of inferiority and superiority travel in tandem with expectations of deference and with rituals that simultaneously create and express the requisite feelings. In the South, just after the Civil War, and depending on the place for many years thereafter, a black person was required to step off the sidewalk when a white person approached, and, if male, to uncover his head. Obedi obedience usually concealed the intrinsic violence of the rule and kept black people visibly in their place. This etiquette was not unique to the United States. In the, interpe in the interpenetration of dreams, Freud recorded his feelings when his father described the same ritual, as performed in the Moravian town of Freiburg. Well dressed and wearing a new fur cap, Freud Sr. was walking along one day, when a Christian came up to me and with a single blow knocked my cap into the mud, shouting, Jew, get off the pavement. The younger Freud then asked his father, and what did you do? Freud Sr. said quietly, I went into the roadway and picked up my cap. Thus did the ritual pass from a bygone real world into the dream life of a new generation. Freud's sidewalk could as well be a highway. On May 24th, 2009, just after 1 p.m., an ambulance owned by the Creek Nation Tribal Authority and an Oklahoma State Police cruiser are winding along the hilly road between Payton and Prague, one behind the other. What happened next, captured on a cell phone, traveled the world via YouTube. One blog yelled the headline, Cop pulls over EMT, emergency medical technician, and gives him the chokehold. Yikes. Holy crap. Next came the news in brief. It was a jarring scene, if only for its incongruity, a highway patrolman trying to arrest an EMT. All the while, there was a woman in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. Because the man being choked was black and the trooper was white, the incident at first looked like an extreme case of driving while black. It was not. When the driver of the Creek Nation ambulance at last agreed to a TV interview, he turned out to be, to all appearance, a white man. At length and under enormous pressure, the authorities released a video of the whole encounter, recorded second by second by the cruiser's dashboard camera. Loudly and with vulgarisms, the trooper chews out the ambulance driver for failing to yield to an emergency vehicle, though he too was driving one, and for having allegedly flipped a bird out the window. I don't have to put up with this shit, this disrespect. The paramedic, who to all appearance is black, and who until then has been in the back of the ambulance, treating the patient, emerges through the back door of the ambulance, steps down, and his back to the camera walks slowly toward the trooper. I am in charge of this unit, he says. He gives his name, presents his card, and suggests that the cruiser follow the ambulance to the hospital. There is a patient. I don't want to talk to you, says the trooper. Go back in the ambulance, get your ass back in the ambulance. He is determined to deal only with the apparently white driver. Freud asked his father, and what did you do? The paramedic's question to him, or to himself, must have been, what shall I do? In response to the trooper's repeated order that he get back in the ambulance, the paramedic makes no move to obey, but keeps intoning words like patient, duty, interfering, emergency vehicle, and sworn to protect. The patrolman moves to arrest him. A scuffle breaks out. The scuffle jolts the ambulance. The patient starts screaming. Newcomers enter the frame. Someone calls the police. The white troopers heard screaming at the driver of the Creek Nation ambulance, tell your manager and your supervisor, jail. A second trooper arrives. A new scuffle ensues when the original trooper tries again to un to handcuff the paramedic. Though held in a chokehold, the paramedic never stops talking, always in low volume. The second trooper, who can also be heard talking in low volume, gradually calms the situation. An observer from the blogosphere 
thought that the paramedic should have deferred to the trooper and that he needed to be taken down a peg or two. Uppity was he talking about his duty to his patient, and did the patient need taking down as well? No matter. The choices are not open to observers rem remaking after the fact and at a safe distance. The point to notice is that in the paramedic's encounter, as in the elder Freud's, violence crackles like electricity. Both encounters show that the everyday routines that organize racism do not always, but always can, explode. Those routines do not require a large stage. They are just as powerful in small events, such as the children's expulsion from the swimming pool, as they are in a duel between adults about deference and respect. Every one of the children present, black or not, participated in a routine of racism that might have ended in violence. Imagine, for example, that just one of the camper's mothers had been present over here. On the spot, unwritten rules that had been keeping black children out became explicit. When children who looked wrong to club members materialized at the pool, all but three parents, heroines of the Republic, did the same thing at the same time, as if a fire alarm had sounded. Sumptuary rules produce a regular supply of circumstantial evidence about what the world is made of and who belongs where within it. Not only can rules endowed with that power shape action in advance, they can also shape opinions of which the holders may be unaware until the moment they come into play. Such rules shape the campaign era mocking of candidate Obama's taste for arugula, the elegant tailoring of his suits, and especially his habit of speaking in complete grammatically correct English sentences. Counterparts of the rules under which pundits mocked Obama's speech daily materialize in inner city schools whenever children learn to mock the use of standard English as trying to be white and to enforce use of black English through bullying. The present authors were teased good-naturedly for talking all proper as elementary school children newly arrived in Washington, D.C., and for speaking standard English with Pittsburgh accents. Daily enforcement of such rules among peer groups of children both creates and polices racial distinctness. Turn now to a familiar scene in which the sumptuary code in effect from beginning to end would doubtless escape a foreigner. Shoppers are scrutinizing the cart of a black woman holding food stamps, judging the appropriateness of her selections. Are food stamp sirloins to be carried away in a welfare Cadillac? Turn the scene around. Now a black woman is under scrutiny for a large order, paid for at the last minute by credit card. Do the racecraft exercise yourself, and then do it again with a black man buying a large grocery order with cash. Now contemplate a double whammy. You are a black woman stepping into a shabby little store in upstate New York. Is it safe? How far away is help? Far. And look at that line of white people ahead of you buying their groceries with food stamps. Whoa. On top of being a black person surrounded by white people in the deep north, here comes the jaw-dropping. But why jaw-dropping? Spectacle of the white woman in front of you. She's coming out of her jeans pocket with a wad of food stamps in her fist. Reason suggests that a racecraft short circuit made the black woman's jaw drop at a sight that should have looked normal. It certainly looked normal to the white people in line with their food stamps. If white people are a majority in the area, then most poor people here, there are white, just as most rich people are. Turn the scene around again. What would have happened if the black woman, in turn, had pulled out a wad of food stamps? And which would racecraft single out for condemnation? An uppity black woman paying with cash or an undeserving black woman paying with food stamps? Along that way, the sumptuary code shades into the peculiar American predicament of having multiple class resentments, but no legitimate language for talking about class. In that setup, the question, why food stamps, has two stock answers, depending on the ancestry of the person using them. On the one hand, fecklessness. On the other, bad luck, plant closing, and the like. Now try a final twist. The food stamp program underwent Rebaptism in 2008 as SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Sleek plastic cards replace the old food stamp vouchers. What else has probably changed? What does not change is that Racecraft generates a unique language opaque to outsiders. 
The phrase social equality was once widely understood by everyone, and especially everyone living in the Jim Crow South. It denoted a precipice that might claim the liberty or even the life of any Afro-American who ventured too near, like the 14-year-old Emmett Till, pistol-whipped, shot, and his mutilated body dumped into the Tallahatchie River in 1955 because he allegedly said bye baby to a white woman or the young man whose misfortune is recounted below in chapter two. Social equality was the taboo that Theodore Roosevelt violated by inviting Booker T. Washington to dine at the White House. Today, social equality has become a sepia-tinted relic, familiar only to scholars and antiquarians. By contrast, race relations, which was coined in the same era, sounds ordinary, and to grasp its weirdness requires historical probing. Invented in the late 19th century heyday of the Jim Crow regime, the term race relations finessed the abrogation of democracy and the bloody vigilantism that enforced it. Unlike social equality, race relations has outlasted the regime that gave birth to it and continues in wide use. A college administrator discussing friction between black and white roommates automatically placed it under the rubric of race relations. Even while aware that the friction involved no more than the usual occasions for roommate disputes, from noise to unauthorized use, to use of each other's property. Then and there, through the transforming power of racecraft, an individual becomes a race, roommates become an interracial pairing, and the outcome, whether friction or friendship, becomes race relations. Sometimes the fog of racecraft rolls in at the last minute as a derailing non sequitur to an otherwise logical argument. A few years ago, the New York Times reported that scientists who conducted an, an epis, epi, fuck, epidemiological study, I'm so sorry, epidemiological study of asthma among school, school children in South Bronx produced damning evidence about environmental pollution caused by heavy truck traffic. Their study identified the particle emissions, cited the location of major highways, and through resourceful data collection, drew conclusions about the children's exposure in specific neighborhoods at different hours of the day to very high fine particle concentrations on a fairly regular basis. The correlations emerged. Symptoms like wheezing doubled on days when pollution from truck traffic was highest. It would seem as clear as noonday that class inequality had imposed sickness on these American school children, yet the article's summary tails off into confused pseudogenetics. To a list of con contributors to high asthma rates that includes heavy traffic, dense population, poorly maintained housing, and lack of access to medical, medical care, the article adds, a large population of Blacks and Hispanics, two groups with high rates of asthma, Racecraft has permitted the consequence under investigation to masquerade among the causes. Susceptibility to filthy air does not depend on the census category to which the asthma sufferer belongs. And even if that susceptibility is, to whatever degree, genetically determined, Dr. Venter's account of his own asthma stands as a reminder that genetic is not equivalent to racial or ethnic. Some of the oddest racecraft moments come with when scientists yoke modern genetics to folk notions. In the controversy over Dr. James D. Watson's remarks in London, some of his defenders charged his critics with a politically correct retreat from science, insisting that good science requires a free marketplace of ideas. Researchers must be free, they imply, to salvage the old bio-racist ranking of superior and inferior races, regardless of the collapse science of its core concept, race. But it is doubtful that those foes of political correctness would wish to rehabilitate that part of bio-racism that once identified inferior white races. If they took their own position seriously, they would applaud the writings of such eminent American scientists of the late 19th century as Edward Drinker Cope and Nathaniel Southgate Shaler, Dean of Harvard's Lawrence Scientific School during the 1890s, on the inequality of races, not simply their work on dinosaurs and the Earth's history. 
Cope advocated both the return of the African to Africa and restrictions on immigration by the half-civilized hordes of Europe. Shaler agreed, characterizing those hordes as inferior by birthright, essentially in the same state as the Southern Negro, and distinct from the Aryan variety of mankind. Popularizers hustled bioracist science into public policy. Madison Grant, who advocated Nordic superiority in his 1916 bestseller, The Passing of the Great Race, The Racial Basis of European History, purported to map class inequality onto physical traits such as height. The Nordic race is everywhere distinguished by great stature. Almost the tallest stature in the world is found among the pure Nordic populations of the Scottish and English borders, while the native British of pre-Nordic brunette blood are, for the most part, relatively short. And no one can question the race value of stature who observes on the streets of London the contrast between the Piccadilly gentleman of Nordic race and the Cockney costermonger, or costermonger street vendor of the old Neolithic type. That was a quotation. In 1924, the lay and scientific streams of bioracism converged in the Immigration Act of 1924, which excluded European races deemed undesirable, and the Virginia Racial Integrity Act, which prohibited mis miscegenation. In the same year, Virginia adopted a law upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court three years later, providing for a compulsory sterilization of persons held to be defective and degenerate, a group that included the shiftless, ignorant, and worthless class of antisocial whites of the South. The Nazis followed these developments closely. When they decided to weed out the unfit, they had American models of how to proceed, from administrative searching of family trees to sterilization. They became the dark apotheosis of eugenics. In 1946, Leslie C. Dunn, a distinguished geneticist and part of a group intent on severing genetics from eugenics, wrote that the field had developed out of the racial problems presented so vividly to the United States by the great immigration of the early part of the century. Consistent application of the free marketplace of ideas principle today would restore to bioracism and eugenics the respectability they once enjoyed. Instead, inferior white races vanished from the lexicon of bioracism to rematerialize outside its purview as ethnic groups. The shiftless, ignorant, and worthless white people vanished altogether. No one attributes to political correctness the demise of bioracism as applied to white persons. So the free marketplace of ideas, apologia for Watson's bioracism as applied to black persons turns out to be a familiar interloper the practice of a double standard. One of the present authors some years ago tested the limits of the free market and racist ideas. A crotchety yet likable right-wing colleague approached, looking disquieted and in need of moral support. He was having trouble with a certain black student in his biopsychology class. What was wrong, he wondered, with saying that black people may, or mind you, may not, prove to be intellectually inferior to white people. In science, you frame a hypothesis, devise an experiment, find out. The student raised her hand and, when recognized, blasted him. Do you know so-and-so, the student in question? Asked the biopsychologist. The author did happen to know the student in question, an 18-year-old single mother of twins who was as bright as they come and not one to brook insult. Why can't she grasp that there's a scientific approach to things? Blah, blah, blah. Finally, the author put a question. If, as you say, there is no hypothesis that science excludes, why not try this assignment? Let your students pick any white ethnic group and any stereotype commonly applied to it. Greedy, mendacious, dumb, drunken, gangsterish, and so on. Then formulate a hypothesis, design the experiment, find out. The colleague's face froze. Years later, an exotic predicament of ethnicity arose in the classroom. A young woman raised her hand but fumbled for words when recognized. Some of us want, I mean, we think we need, then said, I wish I had a race, and fell silent. After a wait, the black woman professor prompted, What do you mean? The student explained that her family had immigrated to the United States from Iran, then stopped again. 
Perhaps the rest seemed obvious to her. It was not obvious to the rest of the class or to the professor. When asked why she wants a race, she mumbled something about the census form. To have to write other isn't, well, it isn't very nice. Understanding then lit faces, understanding then lit faces all around the room. For that young woman not to have a race is to be less than fully American. What can she do but take America's imprisoning social forms as she finds them? In recombinant varieties, they flourish in America's prisons, where not having a race is worse than not nice. It can be a life or death matter. David Ehrenberg, a Jewish inmate in an Illinois penitentiary, has written movingly about how he has survived a five race classification that leaves no room for him. There are woods, short for pecker woods, Euro-Americans distributed between the skinheads and Aryan brothers, kinfolk, Afro-Americans, chiefs, Native Americans, Razas, Americans of Mexican descent, and Pesas, Mexican immigrants. Strictly enforced segregation creates the races. Inmates may play team sports together, but not individual games like chess, may visit each other's cubicles, but not sit on each other's beds, may attend the same church services, but not pray together. The prison's segregated markets also set up monopolies with their associated economic rents. For example, although the Razas and Pesas vend drugs considered better and cheaper, a wood may buy only from another wood. The rule that different races may not break bread together is inviolate, with penalties ranging from beating to execution. Ehrenberg's predicament is that he cannot fit into the chow hall. He may not sit with the woods, to whom Jews are not white, but imposters who don't who don white skin and hide inside it for the purpose of polluting and taking over the white race. He may not sit with the other races who don't understand the subtleties of my treachery and take me for just another wood. Ehrenberg lives on the edge of survival. Finally, a head in the Aryan Brotherhood brokers a, class, a classic Jim Crow solution. <clears throat> Once a suitable quid pro quo, quo has been worked out, the Jewish prisoner is authorized to sit at certain white tables after all the whites have finished eating. The Aryan brother is in earnest. He is logical, practical, and inventive within the racist premises. There is grim American humor in the likelihood that he believes his own rationale even though, or perhaps because, it is absurd. Both absurdity and grim humor, perhaps unintended, combined in in an 1895 New York Times obituary of Frederick Douglass, the celebrated son of a slave and a slave master. The author of the obituary ruminated on the idiotic question that must have been percolating in many minds. Which race could just justly claim this superlatively gifted individual? Um, and this is a quotation from that obituary. It might not be unreasonable, perhaps, to in intimate that his white blood may have something to do with the remarkable energy he displayed and the superior intelligence he manifested. Indeed, it might not be altogether unreasonable to ask whether, with more white blood, he would not have been an even better and greater man than he was, and whether the fact that he had black blood may not have cost the world a genius and be, in consequence, a cause for lamentation instead of a source of lyrical enthusiasm over African possibilities. It is always more or less foolish to credit or discredit a race with the doings, good or bad, of a particular member of that race. But if it must be done, plain justice should see to it that the right race gets the glory or the humiliation. That's horrific. If anyone seeks a monument to racecraft, gaze at that one. In the ultimate solution of the American Negro problem, um, 1913, the historian Edward Eggleston erected another. He solved the Douglas conundrum by invoking, of all things, racial purity. His father was a pure Ang was a pure fuck. His father was a pure Anglo-American. Eggleston's research on the general problem took him to a Negro school, Hampton Institute 
where he noticed the prevalence of light-skinned students. He interviewed a very intelligent and reliable colored man, whom he described as one-fourth Negro, one-fourth Amerind, and the remaining half-white man. The reliable interviewee regards the pure Negro as far below the half-breed in intelligence, though the latter is generally more vicious and criminal, consequent, in part at least, upon a realization of his hopeless position as an inferior, apart from his individual worth, and especially because of his classification as a Negro. That was a quotation. Then the interviewee added a twist, which Eggleston transcribed without comment. He also regards the mulatto as mentally and physically inferior to the pure-blooded white man, but holds that justice demands that they may be recognized as occupying an, an intermediate position between the two races. While the white races of the past became ethnic groups, the opposite has happened to the census category Hispanic. Discussing the mark Discussing the mark one or more option that appeared for the first time on the 2000 census, a reporter dutifully explained that Hispanic designates an ethnicity, not a race, and that Hispanics can be of any race. Such, in any case, was said to be of to be official thinking when the Nixon administration concocted the term Hispanic for the 1970 census. Be it remembered that Nixon's infamous Southern strategy required alertness to every political nuance of racecraft, North and South. Whatever the official rationale claimed, a new minority was born. Census enumerators in California were soon locking horns with Hispanic families who rejected the term Hispanic. Some preferred to identify with a specific country or of origin or heritage. Others insisted on their Indian ethnicity. After all, they had been invited to self-identify. By 2003, the Census Bureau was reporting that Hispanics had become the largest minority group in the United States, still insisting in its press release that, unlike Blacks and Asians, Hispanics are not a race. Blood bank officials in Detroit evidently thought otherwise. When they set out in, eight, in 1986 to search for rare blood types found almost exclusively among minority donors, they were determined to identify the donors by race. From that, it surely followed that Hispanic had its place alongside black and white in their reports. The new census category thus hatched a new pseudo pseudogenetic population. Once hatched, the new population, by definition, would have its own distinguishing blood and rare antigens, though not so distinguishing as to rule out grouping Oriental, Hispanic, and Native American donors together in the search. By 2007, Hispanic had taken another step toward becoming a race when enterprising researchers sought and received taxpayers' money for research on something called a Hispanic genome. A brief article on an inside page of the Washington Times disclosed that the researchers, having received money from the Veterans Affairs Department, or Department, sorry, broke federal rules by crossing the U.S. border to pay subjects in Mexico for blood samples. The researchers' travel invoice included taking the government car into Juarez to see a subject for the Latino genetics study. Their work involved testing to identify genetic tendencies and illnesses and disorders among Hispanics. The researchers had established contact with 20 subjects and paid $125 for two blood samples and an interview when an anonymous whistleblower prompted an investigation. Eventually, the director of the New Mexico Veterans Administration Healthcare System announced that the research projects had been suspended. Does anyone doubt that in the future, a purportedly race-specific new remedy or repatented new dosage of an old one will spring forth from work like that attempted by the researchers in Juarez, say for asthma among Hispanics? After all, the Food and Drug Administration set the president by approving Bedil, a fixed-dose combination of two old drugs, allowing it to be repatented as a new and race-specific drug for African-American heart patients. The clinical trials involved only self-identified African-American patients, that is to say no control groups and says, and says so genetics. 
The patent applicant's shortcut science stirred further controversy because the cost of the combination far exceeded that of its two components. Michael Banton's point about segregation and market organization apply in this instance. Although the civilian purveyors of prescription drugs work by crafty marketing, while the imprisoned purveyors of street drugs work by occasional violence, both take advantage of segregated markets to augment their profits. In everyday doing, visible things like segregated markets come into view as things done and imagined and yet are thought of as having natural causes. It is as though the rules and rituals of segregation are sufficient to make race visible, but not sufficient to make it real. Along that way, blood, though ordinarily invisible, takes on a peculiar role and script that calls for an extravagance of light. The, De the Detroit blood bankers of a while ago, who imagined extremely rare blood types as a racial characteristic, were strangely untroubled when nature had its say. Only 50 of the 7,706 black donors were tested, fewer than 7 per thousand carried the four rare antigens that they had sought exclusively among black donors. For a time, however, they were troubled indeed by a widespread public mistrust and by recalcitrant groups opposed to labeling by race. So they had to prove not only that their program was worth was worthy, but also that its motives were trustworthy. At a different level, the plot thickened over the practical question of how to determine an individual's race. The result had to be valid, yet voluntary. It would not do simply to look at a would-be donor and then decide, or just as bad to look and then ask. In the end, they devised an incantation. Interviewers were instructed to ask, which racial group should I record for you? Black, white, Hispanic, American Indian, or other? This has been accepted well. Talk of blood is as sticky and slippery as the substance itself.